Hi all, thanks for coming back, listening again. Um, I want to talk about the Battle of Britain in cinema, which is opposed to the Battle of Britain film, the 1969 star-studded epic that we all know and love so well. But it's a bit more complicated than that. It isn't just about one film. And the other thing that's interesting is the ongoing debate between historians and filmmakers which is a big thing in academia. I studied it at university some years ago, and it was very interesting about this juxtaposition between the historian's quest for accuracy and accurate interpretation of events based upon evidence, and the filmmaker whose job is to transfer a story or a piece of history onto the film, onto the silver screen. And to do that, a filmmaker only has a comparatively microscopic time frame. So something like the Battle of Britain, for example, is a big story, massive story, actually. It's not just about a, few, uh, a handful of Spitfire and Hurricane pilots, far from it. Uh, if you were to look at the thing as a whole, uh, you've got Coastal Command, Bomber Command, you've got the Germans, you've got the Home Front, you've got the Emergency. It's a massive story. Huge story. How on earth are you supposed to do that, even in two hours? I don't know. So it becomes necessary for filmmakers to have composite characters. You may have uh, one fictitious character that's actually been inspired by um, several different people and their roles, and to telescope events. So um, events have to be compressed. The, the wider context, it may not be possible to explain all of that. Um, you know, very much the case, very, very often the case. So it's complicated, isn't it? And, I, you know, I take my hat off to these filmmakers. I, I really do, because I think it's an incredibly difficult thing. Um, now, of course, what the academic historians um, play up about is the fact that this view of history uh, is inaccurate and therefore wrong. Uh, and a film that was studied and, and cited, um, oh, that Mel Gibson film about the uh, American War of Independence, I forget what it was called now. I mean, I like the film as a film, as entertainment, but historically it's completely inaccurate, as is Braveheart, actually, uh, and many others. But, but the point is, they're not made as documentaries, these films. They're made as entertainment. And at the end of the day, uh, if they inspire interest in the subject and inspire people to perhaps go away and get some books, because that's where the real knowledge is, isn't it, books, uh, and do some reading and do their own research and to find out more about it, then that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and that's why I'm fully on the side of films. I get the historian's point. I'm a historian myself, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and uh, I get it. But there's a bigger picture, no pun intended. For example, when I was, I think, seven years old, the Battle of Britain, seven or eight, the Battle of Britain film came out, and I, I was already well into it, you know, make no mistake, brought up in the 60s against the backdrop of war comics, war toys, model planes and so on and so forth and the relentless barrage of war films generally and i bought into it all um but i went to see the battle of britain film now you know i've studied the film and i have been through the film frame by frame and done what's called a reading which uh, which actually was in this book the battle of britain uh, in on the big screen which really focuses no pun intended again on the Battle of Britain story in British cinema, which is what we're going to talk about. Um, but going through it every few seconds and commenting on significant things, you know, things that are right, things that are wrong, what's actually happening, and maybe not, the, the, the viewer uh, without the knowledge may not be uh, fully conversant with, and so on and so forth. You know, really interesting thing to do, actually, called a reading. And when I did this book, I did a reading for probably five or six films, and each one took about five days to do. Uh, it reminded me very much of my days as a detective, you know, now some years ago. Uh, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, transcribing, tape recorded interviews. But anyway, there we are. So, 
film's an amazing thing uh, and of course propaganda is so important during wartime to maintain and increase the morale of your own people uh, and of course to demonize the enemy uh, and Hitler certainly harnessed all of that in, in uh, Lenny Rosenthal's incredible film uh, Triumph of the Will before the war which showed Hitler uh, at the great Nazi Nuremberg rally. It's on YouTube it's a real genius propaganda film. Didn't do Lenny Rosenthal much good. She didn't get any work after the war. But uh, everybody cites that film as a masterpiece of propaganda, which it is. Um, now, now, with the Battle of Britain, it, it's a funny old thing, really, because everybody was terrified of air power between the wars. So there were a couple of real doomy, gloomy films came out before the war. Things to Come, which which told of, uh, I think it was Every Town, which gets uh, pulverised by enemy bombers or and then defended by, by fighters and, uh, to really show the air defences, but it was all quite gloomy um, and sort of uh, bought into this, the bomber will always get through business. And uh, as Trenchard said, there's no defence on earth going to save you from the bombers. And, Fighters are of only, only any use to keep up the morale of one's own people, extraordinarily. Um, and then The Gap. Now, The Gap was an interesting film because the idea of it was to recruit uh, a deficiency of manpower uh, in certain areas of the air defence system. And it showed, uh, perhaps <laughs> counterproductively, because of those deficiencies in manpower, it showed a town getting absolutely plastered by enemy bombers. So the sort of theme of the Battle of Britain that was to come uh, was already there. Now, now the, the issue was, once war began, of course, it was a question of an antidote to those doomy, gloomy films. Uh, and this came in a film called The Lion Has Wings, which featured, uh, ironically perhaps, a flight of 74 Squadron Spitfires whilst the other flight was actually involved in the Battle of Barking Creek friendly fire incident, but uh, that's an awful another day. Uh, but yeah, the lion has wings. The idea of that film was to reassure the public that Britain's air defences were up to the job uh, and uh, there was nothing to worry about. So then, so in a way, uh, that sort of showed the Battle of Britain before it had even begun because this film was made in September 1939, Extraordinary. Uh, and then we go on into the war, uh, and, uh, and it's really important to understand that in those days we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have all these communication platforms that we've got today, people didn't even have televisions in their own homes. Uh, it was a question of listening to the radio, uh, and that was the great broadcasting medium, was the radio, uh, hence why Neville Chamberlain, Britain's wartime Prime Minister at the beginning of the war, made the famous broadcast at 11am on 3rd of Sunday, 3rd of September 1939. You know, it was by the radio. So if people wanted to watch movies, moving pictures, they went to the cinema. And because this concentrated people together, at the start of the war, cinemas were closed because uh, they wanted to avoid all those people together uh, possibly being hit by bombs. Uh, but ultimately, the cinemas reopened again. And one of the reasons was because uh, they were such an important means of communicating information to the public by the Ministry of Information. So uh, you've got things like Pathé News and Movie Tone News that produced some really amazing films all through the war. Very, very short films, only a few minutes, uh, are showing you know, the troops on different fronts. There's really good ones about Spitfires, Hurricanes, and Battle of Britain. You know, all sorts of stuff. And people used to go to the cinema specifically to spend an afternoon watching this stuff because that was the news. That was the equivalent of when I was a kid uh, growing up and switching on the news at six or the news at ten uh, that my dad always watched. Uh, and that was it. But you went to the cinema. So the cinema is a really big part of uh, Western culture. Uh, and I oh, know it, it still is to a degree. But this is different. You know, the cinema was huge. In those days and there were various films that, that came out I mean some that we've probably forgotten about like um, 
there's a film, uh, Dangerous Moonlight, which really focuses on, on a pianist who's a Polish fighter pilot, very famous film, uh, Anton Walbrook. And um, then there's another one that features the Belgians, which are the only body I think has ever heard of this, called Flemish Farm. Uh, and they're flying hurricanes over in France, during the fall of France. And there's a scene where um, they, they escape from an airfield before it's overrun, with a pilot putting another pilot on his lap in this hurricane. Now, where have we seen that before? You've got it. Battle of Britain, 1969, the, one of the opening scenes. It had to have been inspired by Flemish Farm, which we've never heard of. Then there's films like Tawny Pippet, which is about a wounded Spitfire pilot recovering uh, in Gloucestershire, actually, not far from where I live now, uh, Lois Slaughter, where uh, Gordon Mitchell lived, in fact. He was R.J. Mitchell's son, a very good friend of mine, sadly died uh, some years ago now. But um, the film was nothing really to do with Spitfires or the Battle of Britain. It was about saving uh, a, a particularly endangered um, bird. But the Spitfire still features in the film, as it did with Mrs. Miniver, which is one of the most famous, most successful uh, propaganda films of all time that was really geared up to getting the Americans uh, on our side uh, during the war with America still being neutral. Greer Garson, uh, it's, it's an incredible film. Even Dr. Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, had to acknowledge that Mrs. Miniver was such a superb piece of propaganda because at no time in that film was it derogatory about the Germans. But it was obvious what the theme was that the Germans were bombing Britain and poised to invade Britain. Uh, and yet, when Mrs. Miniver encounters a shot down German airman, she's you know, kind to the, to the chap. Um, but again, Spitfires and the Battle of Britain are very much the theme of that, although it's not about the Battle of Britain. So then we come on to, uh, I think the same year as Mrs. Miniver, Leslie Howard's film, The First of the Few which again isn't about the Battle of Britain, but it features the Battle of Britain. And the film's about, it's a romanticised version of events actually, about R.J. Mitchell designing the Spitfire, the Schneider Trophy racing and so on, starring David Niven and um, uh, Rosamund John. Uh, and it, it, it's a really good film. And it was massive success on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, now, what's significant about that film is the opening scene show fighter pilots outside dispersal at Ibsley in Hampshire. And uh, they are real fighter pilots, some of whom I knew. And there's people there like John Bisney, Bisdy, who flew Spitfires with 609 in the Battle of Britain, uh, Bunny Current, who was then commanded 501 Squadron, but flew with 605 in the battle. Peter Howe Williams, real character, who I knew, flew Spitfires with, with 19. Uh, and many others, Brian Kingcom, famously from 92 Squadron. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to see that, that they filmed that. Uh, and of course, there were real Spitfires used uh, for the filming that was supplied by 118 Squadron down at Ibsley. And it was a, it's a, it was a massive success. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's got all the ingredients, hasn't it? Mitchell dying of cancer prematurely, age 42, such a tragedy, you know, and the Spitfire going on to, uh, to win the day as it were. And that was really important because they, the public needed reassurance about air defence and the Spitfire was this glamorous icon then and now uh, that in those days was the sort that was going to save us from the German bombers. So uh, absolutely fantastic film. And then um, we go on really to after the war when uh, in 1952 came the first British film dealing with the Battle of Britain, and that was Angels 1-5. Now, personally, uh, I hate the film, apart from the fact that it shows uh, Kenley uh, in that immediate post-war period, and they use real aircraft in, in a lot of the scenes that were flown by, they were hurricanes provided by the Portuguese Air Force. Um, actually, that's what's on the cover of this book, although it's not entirely obvious what they are. Uh, Pen and Sword do fantastic covers, but of all my books, this is the one I like the least. Um, that's another story. But yeah, Angels 1-5. But again, this film is focusing on an individual, Septic Baird, a uh, young pilot officer and his 
adventures and changing personality. But but what, what I take issue with the film is the it's all about posh offices and the uh, the only reference to the working classes are a couple of airmen uh, working on a hurricane who are seen as sort of um, let's let, let's just say pretty thick. Uh, uh, and it's it's just a sign of the times, really. Those hierarchical society days. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not a fan. Angels won five. Then, 1956 comes Danny Angel's Reach for the Sky, based on Paul Brickhill's uh, global blockbusting, best-selling romantic yarn about Douglas Bader of the same title, uh, published in 1954. Reach for the Sky again. This is focusing not on the big Back of Britain story, but it's focusing on the story of an individual. In this case, the inspirational Douglas Bader. You've got to admire the man uh, uh, doing what he did without legs at the time uh, when King's regulations didn't provide for disabled pilots, limbless pilots, uh, and his sheer bloody mindedness got him back in the cockpit to become a fighter ace and a fighter leader. And if you watch the film, you would think that the big wing, as it was called, flying from Duxford in 12 Group, was uh, uh, winning the Battle of Britain single-handedly, which is patent nonsense, we now know, that the big wing actually overclaimed by up to 7 to 1. And I've written books about it, I've forensically investigated and explored and, uh, the whole story uh, of the big wing, uh, the political side of it, the tactical side of it, the combat side of it, uh, and Reach of the Skies version is really inaccurate. But there we are. So there are a number of these films, but then you get to 1969 and our beloved Battle of Britain, uh, directed by Guy Hamilton and produced by Ben Fizz, who himself had been a, a Polish fighter pilot on 303 Squadron. And it was the first attempt to tell the big story. Uh, and I think they did it very well. There are some things that are wrong, uh, and didn't happen, such as the meeting in Dowding's office between uh, Patrick Weimar, Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory, and Trevor Howard, Air Vice Marshal Park, uh, over the big wing argument, and that meeting never happened, uh, and in Dowding, by Dowding's own admission, um, that was his his only, really, admission, uh, own mission, rather, during the battle, that he didn't get those commanders together to get it sorted out. But Dowding was the strategist, and he had um, given tactical control of the battle to those group commanders, and they should have got on with it vis-à-vis uh, -vis their commander's wishes, which unfortunately Lee Mallory did not. But again, all of that for another day. But Battle of Britain was incredible because a lot of these films, Reach for the Sky particularly, although there are real aircraft, a lot of the scenes are also done with models, and, and they're, they're, they're old black and white films. They just didn't resonate for young schoolboys of the day. And then we've got Battle of Britain using mainly real aircraft provided by the Spanish Air Force. The, uh, the ME 109s in inverted commas were Hispano Bucon fighters with Merlin engines that based upon the 109 design. And the Heinkel 111 bombers were also Kazas um, uh, with Merlin engines. But they're real aircraft. And Battle of Britain inspired this whole new wave of the vintage aircraft movement with aircraft being restored and put back in the air for the film or restored to taxi in condition. And that's where it all began. So we owe the Battle of Britain a lot. And moreover, and furthermore, it was in colour. Fantastic. I remember going to see that film with my dad uh, when it premiered in Worcester on the big screen at the, um, the Odeon or the Scala, wherever it was, I forget now. But I was spellbound to actually see those aircraft at such close quarters on a huge screen. Um, it was just phenomenal. Uh, and, and it remains the case. I couldn't tell you how many times I've watched it. Uh, and will continue to watch it unashamedly. It's fantastic. Uh, not altogether entirely accurate. The end of the film, you could be forgiven for thinking that the Battle of Britain just ended. Boom, just like that. It did uh, it went on and on and on. In fact, November was very little different to October. The Battle of Britain officially finished on the 31st of October, all of which is poppycock anyway. If you look on the podcast, because um, when I did the official eight-volume history of the Battle of Britain, 
the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust. It's a one million word uh, forensic investigation. You know, I, I challenge the official date, uh, and uh, uh, you, you know, you really do get that wrong impression that there was a resounding victory uh, and a very clear cut end to the battle. There wasn't, but nonetheless, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. But there's never been another Battle of Britain. The film itself, whilst uh, enormously popular uh, and loved beyond all measure by people like us, aviation enthusiasts and uh, Battle of Britain historians and so on, uh, the wider public sort of gave it a bit of a wider berth because it didn't really connect with individuals emotionally. Um, but nonetheless, the Battle of Britain has done its great service. It's done the Battle of Britain great service uh, and it's, it really has. Um, but there was never another attempt. Now, you imagine no, that was a one-off opportunity to make that film in 1968, to, to, to release it in 1969, when those aircraft were still flying, were still available in numbers today. Flying vintage aircraft incredibly expensive, incredibly with the insurance, with the running costs to produce. I mean, and in fact, the, the number of aircraft assembled for the film uh, made them the 35th biggest air force in the world, which is astonishing in itself. And you think how much that must have cost. So the cost of it was just not going to happen. And quite honestly, uh, even now, and we've just had uh, the Spielberg Hanks Masters of the Air uh, American 8th Air Force miniseries broadcast on uh, Apple TV, which uses CGI, which is not bad. It's not bad. It, it's a bit too much bells and whistles for me, but, but it's not bad. It's getting better unlike some of the earlier, uh, sort of what I would call immediately modern films, uh, and particularly the low budget ones that use CGI, and it's, it's just unbelievable, it's just not believable, uh, but it's getting better. Uh, but Battle of Britain with those real aircraft, real standalone moments, and of course a lot of the outtakes from Battle of Britain, and there, there, there was loads of it, minutes and minutes and minutes of it, uh, were not used in the film. But they have been used since in various documentaries uh, and other films, films like, well, TV series really, like Piece of Cake back in the 80s and Perfect Hero starring Nigel Havers, which is sort of loosely based on Richard Hillary's Last Enemy being shot down and badly burned. There are loads of these things. But the favourite for me is my friend um, Matthew Whiteman, who's a, a long established film director, uh, uh, read. Jeffrey Welland's memoir, First Light, and was uh, deeply moved by this and got to know Jeff, uh, who sold him the film rights to the book for a pound. And Matthew, to his great credit, at what was a difficult time, uh, sort of 2009-ish, went off and made and got commissioned, and that was the difficult bit, uh, a BBC Two docudrama, First Light, which you can get on DVD, you can still watch it, it's not available online, unfortunately but you can watch it. Uh, and there are continuity errors and, and silly things like officers sit, sitting down in offices with the hats on. Well, the only time that happens is in a formal interview or a rollicking. Uh, but, but, you know, none of that's important. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter that it's one Spitfire took off, but in the air it's a different Spitfire. It's that, that's just ridiculous. You know, it's like an old history lecture used to say to me, uh, an, an air class studying history and film, used to say, if it's got the right, wrong tank track, my dear, I don't give a damn. Because that's right, it's not about the, the, the minute detail like that, it's about the telling of the bigger story. And the way Matthew did it, with Jeff actually still alive there, and talking, and with some of the things Jeff says about his love for the Spitfire, how it gets into your soul, uh, and how uh, we didn't want to meddle, but we, we just want, want, want to be remembered. Uh, and these things, and how can I forget being a Spitfire pilot in the Battle of Britain? You know, you, you see things in your head every day. Like, how can I forget? You know, it's just one of the most moving pieces of television I've ever seen. And, um, you know, well done, Matthew. And I, I think that um, when I wrote this book a couple of years ago, um, which studies all of these films in, in detail, you know, I did say that I think the Battle of Britain film 1969 was the high spot of the Battle of Britain in cinema. And Matthew's film was the high spot 
of the Battle of Britain on television, which remains the case. However, what I also said was that Matthew's film could also have been called Last Light in terms of television, because certainly when it was made, and when I wrote a few, uh, the final few in 2015, the chapter about Jeff, I focused, no pun intended, on Matthew's film, of what it meant to him to, play, uh, to produce the film and direct the film and why he did it, and what it meant to young, at the time, Sam Hewan, to play Jeff. And of course, Sam has gone on to great fame with his portrayal of Jamie Fraser in, in the Netflix Outlander series. You know, absolutely fair play to him. It's brilliant. Well done, Jamie. Uh, uh, no, not Jamie, Sam. But, uh, um, yeah, we're not convinced now that it is Last Light. Since Matthews made that film, 2010, it was broadcast. The broadcasting landscape has changed beyond all recognition. In those days, we still only had BBC One, BBC Two, ITV and Channel 4, Channel 5 loosely. So now it's completely changed. We've got all of these different online platforms. The internet's changed everything. We have uh, Disney, Apple, uh, Prime, Samsung, I think, have got a channel, Netflix. So the opportunities are there. And it's also much easier uh, technically to make a film these days because of the incredible advances in technology. I'm talking to you now on a fairly modest camera setup, but you know, the results are pretty good. Uh, and you know, I, I, I use my iPhone for other things, for filming outside, for filming shorts. Oh, and we can all make a film almost. I'm not suggesting that you make a blockbusting cinema film with, with kit like that, but I just make the point that today you don't need the massive budget that, that used to be required for all, all of the kit and so on and so forth. So who knows what's going to happen? What I don't like to see are these low budget films that are inaccurate and don't listen to historians or even engage with historians. I think they'd be more harm than good, um, but at least they're being made. And I, I wonder whether one day we will see another fairly biggish production, or at least some very good, uh, very accurate documentary drama uh, type stories translated to the screen, similarly to how Matthew did First Light. And in that respect, Matthew and I are looking forward at the moment to uh, working together in due course, and more of that another time. So. So there we are, a little bit of a whistle-stop tour about the Battle of Britain's development on, on the big screen, uh, very much detailed in the book. I think it was an important book to write, it was an important record to uh, commit to paper so that uh, the chronology of this is understood. And um, there we are. So go and watch the Battle of Britain film, go and be inspired, go and watch Angels 1-5, see if you like it, go and watch uh, The Gap, look them up on YouTube and uh, uh, Things to Come, The Lion Has Wings, wonderful films, whatever you might think of them, uh, and do watch uh, First Light, it's brilliant. So there we are, thanks for listening. If you enjoy our little films and podcasts, there's gonna be lots more coming, please subscribe to the channel, uh, give us a thumbs up. Uh, any feedback, good or bad, please join the discussion, join the community in the comments below, and we'll see you next time when um, I'll have to think of something else to, uh, to talk about and share my passion for the Battle of Britain. Thanks for listening.